Okay, I think we're live. Uh, hello and welcome to Patreon live stream or Patreon only live stream number two. Uh, this episode, I'm going to be talking about neuroplasticity and how it contributes to depression. Um, so this is a topic I think will be really interesting to a lot of people. Um, so if anyone comes in during the live, uh, just be sure to drop your your questions in the chat. Um, love to answer them as I go. Okay, so to begin, I want to, if we're talking about depression, I want to kind of get us all on the same page about what I mean by this term depression, what kind of scientists mean and clinicians mean. And then uh, after that, I'm, I'm not just going to be reading. Uh, I will be, uh, it'll be more of a, like a conversational or just kind of a discussion format. So I'll just start with reading and then kind of head on to that piece that I talked about in just one moment. Um, okay. All right. Looks like we're good here. Hopefully the audio is good. Um, okay. So I, I wrote this short little piece to uh, just to describe what I mean by depression, what it means to me and what, what I kind of to bring this whole discussion, neuroscience and um, depression together. So it starts out with a, a short poem and I'm not really a poet, but I, I do like, enjoy writing it sometimes. So uh, bear with me. Inside the organ of mind, circuits of pain and pleasure constantly redesigned. We learn to love and to hurt, to hope and to fear. So beware the brain's power to distort what appears. So Depression is a trap. The walls seem to get narrower by the day until you begin to suffocate. Soon, misery reaches a crescendo, and you've all but forgotten about the brighter world that exists above you, because all you can see is yourself, alone, in this pit. If it goes on too long and continues to worsen, you might find yourself contemplating what used to be the unthinkable, to stop living altogether. This is the tragic end that many people meet when depression goes untreated and spirals out of control. But that's just one possible scenario. Far more often than not, when people do decide to at least try to begin to make a little bit of progress out of the pit, their understanding of themselves and their situation begins to transform. It is never easy, but it is certainly possible to pull oneself up from the depths of depression, especially when one can ask for help. Happiness is possible, even if it sometimes seems ridiculous to even contemplate. Of course, that description of depression is really just a metaphor. Depression is ex an extremely common mood disorder. It afflicts just under 7% of, uh, and something I kind of want you to chew on throughout this is that there's a lot of individual variability. There, depression isn't just a single thing. Uh, the term depression is really an umbrella term for, for a cluster of symptoms that vary from individual to individual. So the American Psychiatric Association writes that depression, so I want to kind of give a, an overview of what um, depression is from kind of a clinical standpoint, because I think it really, really can open up your mind about what we're talking about. It's not just sadness. It's not just um, bad mood, but let me, let me read what they have to say about it. They say, quote, Depression symptoms can vary from mild to severe and can include feeling sad or having a depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure in activities once enjoyed, and that's also called anhedonia, the inability to experience pleasure, changes in appetite, weight loss or gain unrelated to dieting, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, loss of energy or increased fatigue, increase in purposeless activity, physical activity. So for example, inability to sit still, there's pacing, hand wringing, or slowed movements or speech. That was also referred to as sometimes psychomotor retardation, that slowed movement or speech. And that those actions must be severe enough to be, must represent a change in your previous level of functioning for that diagnosis to be made. But it's not that you have to have all of these symptoms all at once. Um, many clinicians say usually that at least five of those symptoms must be present and that uh, during that two-week period, and that at least one of the symptoms must be 
depressed mood or loss of pleasure and enjoyment. So that sad, really sad mood or the anhedonia. So those are, are common um, symptoms, but at least one of those has to be present during that two week period um, uh, to be considered a diagnosis of depression. Again, I'm not a clinician. I'm, I'm reading from what uh, the American Psychiatric Association has to say about this, and that comes from their DSM-5. So clearly, depression will vary from case to case. If we don't have all the same symptoms, then my depression is probably not the same as yours. But there do appear to be two core symptoms, uh, the depressed mood, which we just talked about, and the anhedonia. So the this persistent sadness, um, over that two week period, it's not just normal, you know, intense sadness, but persistent uh, depressed mood or a loss of pleasure and enjoyment, anhedonia. So without one of those, you could have all those other symptoms, or at least most of them, and maybe not be diagnosed with depression. So anyway, I just wanted to give that kind of clinical overview of uh, what, what we're talking about here, because I don't want to just lapse into people thinking about depression as just mere sadness or a bad mood or melancholy or, or any of that. It's, it really is a um, clinical diagnosis. Now, um, on a personal note, I'm guessing that a lot of people listening to this, watching this, have struggled with depression. And um, I think, or at least they've been touched by it by maybe a family member or a friend. And in my own life, I I've struggled with depression in the past. I wouldn't, I don't have severe depression. I don't have major depressive disorder. Um, but I have like a mild or moderate depression that kind of comes on and off in, in bouts. I've been through therapy. Um, and I will say it's definitely gotten better over the years with, with doing that kind of treatment and my own, um, sort of ways of dealing with it. But, um, like many people, my depression tends to kind of come back during times of intense, stress, chronic stress going on for long periods. We'll talk about why that is. That directly relates to this idea of neuroplasticity deficits in depression. Um, but I also just want to mention, you know, I know how how bad this can get. I, I haven't been uh, in the, the true depths of, of deep, um, you know, major depressive disorder, but I, I did have a friend about 10 years ago who took his own life. And I know, you know, how much that can hurt, how how damaging and and awful, the, the kind of worst effects of depression can be. Um, and I think we all have some kind of personal connection, whether we've had depression, we know someone who has it. And I just want to be sensitive to anyone out there who's experiencing it. I know how difficult it is. Um, I hope that understanding this model of depression can help you conceptualize what you're going through. Um, again, I'm not trying to tell you how to treat your depression. I'm not a doctor, not a clinician. But I do think that this kind of thing helps me, and I think it can help others as well. So, um, a great a great resource from uh, for for those kinds of tools for overcoming or lessening depression and symptoms, as well as kind of an overview of the neurochemistry of depression, is um, episode thirty four of Dr. Andrew Huberman's podcast, the Huberman Lab podcast, and I've linked to that in the description. Great overview of depression, the neurochemistry, the role of um, serotonin and endorphins and other sorts of um, hormones and neurotransmitters, as well as a lot of really useful tools. So I'll point you to that. That's in the description of the Huberman Lab podcast, episode 34. Um, but for this episode, so the, the sources I'll be relying on for this episode to be talking about neuroplasticity and neurobiology of depression, primarily I'm going to be focusing on a 2020 review article that was published in the journal Molecular Psychiatry called Neuroplasticity in Cognitive and Psychological Mechanisms of Depression, an Integrative Model. And that is by psychologist Rebecca Price and the late neuroscientist Ronald Duman. Um, these uh, these uh, researchers have done um, really seminal, amazing work with uh, ketamine as a uh, treatment for depression. And you may have heard of ketamine before. Um, I'll talk more about that at the end when I get to some of the, the treatments and how they kind of tap into this plasticity. But I've also listed uh, a talk from both Rebecca Price and Ronald Duman, each of them, uh, in the uh, description of this video. So check those out if you're interested in um, in going deeper into this. I've also listed that paper, of course. So 
this episode is not a substitute for that paper in any way. I'm, I'm trying to kind of extract um, knowledge and lessons from that paper as well as drawing on other sources. And um, there will be times I'll, I'll talk about something and maybe I'm speculating, but I will mention that when I'm kind of going beyond what, what is supported in the literature directly at least. Okay. So we talked about kind of what is depression in a psychological sense, but what is neuroplasticity? This is kind of the other half of this discussion. And um, I just did uh, this past week, did an episode of the social brain with uh, my friend and co-host of that podcast, Taylor Guthrie, where we talked all about neuroplasticity, how it works. Um, it's a huge topic. We did like an overview, but the, the basics are that uh, neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change itself through behavior and experience. It's basically like the rewiring and modulation of neural circuits in the brain. And this happens at the level of cells and then ultimately at the level of kind of networks um, and activation in the brain. But neuroplasticity is involved in all forms of learning and personal change. And we'll see why that's so important in the context of depression. Um, and then just like a final note on neuroplasticity, it's it's often touted as like, oh, wow, this, this cool thing, interesting thing the brain does. But the reality is neuroplasticity is not just some cool trick. It's not just something that the nervous system does that's like interesting and fun. It's fundamentally important for our health and effective brain functioning to even you know adapt to our environment to to be a functioning human being in our world requires neuroplasticity okay so with that out of the way i want to move on to uh this stress and depression so i mentioned earlier that stress can set off a bout of depression for people that are predisposed to depression or have already had um had depression in the past. So depression can be induced by severe stressors like a trauma, a traumatic experience, but that's not a necessary condition. That's just, um, that's one way that it can be set off by, you know, intense grief or, or some horrible experience. But one of the strongest predictors of chronic, of, a, of a clinical depression is not acute stress, not that single event stress, like um, something bad happening, but kind of moderate chronic stress, like maybe repeated failures at work that just happen over and over and over again, or or um, something like that, that's just sort of beating down, just dripping, drip, 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 and it's this negative stress. It's not this stimulating, um, what is sometimes called you stress as opposed to distress, but it's that distress. It's the It's that chronic stress over and over again. And maybe the fundamental reason for this is that chronic stress can lead to decreases in certain molecules in the brain, like neurotrophic factors, molecules that help brain cells grow and keep the brain healthy in general, can lead to decreases in those, as well as increases in stress hormones, which um, together can actually lead to damaged, shrinking, or otherwise unhealthy neurons. And this can lead to decreases in plasticity at the cellular level and at the level of, of brain networks. And we'll talk about that, that. But that is where plasticity comes in, right? So chronic stress can lead to this lessened plasticity, and that can lead to depression, or at least that's what this model proposes. So let's get into that. This is called... This model is called the integrative model, or that's what Price and Duman kind of named it in their, their 2020 paper. And it argues that studies of the cellular and molecular biology of depression, as well as the behavioral, cognitive, neurological, and clinical outcomes of depression could be united by the idea that depression is primarily caused or, or associated with deficits of neuroplasticity. So I just, that's kind of this overview. And now I do want to mention that it's possible that similar plasticity deficits are present in other affective disorders like anxiety disorders. But as we'll see, deficits of plasticity seem to be especially relevant for depression, according to this model. And I just mentioned that this plays out at different levels. And I kind of want to just give an overview of, of how that plays out in the brain and the mind um, in terms of plasticity deficits. So um, 
at the molecular and cellular level, there's this reduced synapse number, the reduced number of synapses, connections among neurons, and their function. It's reduced neurotrophic factors like we we're talking about. Um, and this is in depression. At the neural network level, there's reduced connectivity between the PFC, the prefrontal cortex, and the limbic circuitry, the, the limbic system, which is kind of traditionally uh, thought of as being involved in emotion and affective processing, but also in um, uh, sort of autonomic regulation, regulation of the body and of the fight or flight response and um, anticipation, reward, pleasure, lots of different things happening in that subcortical limbic circuitry. Cognitively, um, there is uh, in depression, lower cognitive and executive, cognitive control and executive functioning. And we'll talk about what that is, but it has a lot to do with working memory, with um, planning, with uh, emotional regulation, behavioral regulation. And this also plays out in um, memory deficits. Um, we'll talk about that as well. And what you're beginning to see is this, this inflexibility, this rigidity of the depressed brain. Also, um, affective information processing. So there's these attentional biases, interpretive biases, memory biases toward negative information. And also um, as regards the self, there's this bias toward um, uh, remembering information that is uh, negatively valenced, that's bad in some way. And then um, a clinical, uh, clinically, uh, when people, you know, if you've ever been in, in therapy for depression, maybe you noticed this in yourself that you were inflexible. You, you were like, my life sucks. Things are bad. I'm going to stay. I, this is how it's always going to be. There's no way to get out of this and maybe unwilling to do the kinds of behaviors or, or resistant to doing the kinds of behaviors that would make things better. And there's this repetitive negative thinking, rumination over bad things. Um, so this is, you know, at these various levels of the molecules and the cells of the brain, the networks of the brain, cognitive and affective information processing, and then the kind of uh, clinical um, diagnosis. So, so we'll get into all that. But what I'm trying to show here is the kind of inflexibility, the, the, the problems with plasticity at all these levels. So um, just one second, I want to make sure audio is good. Um, let's see. Well, hopefully it is. Don't think I can check at this point. Um, but uh, if, yeah, I think we're good. Okay. So in other words, the symptoms of depression may fundamentally stem from a highly rigid brain. And uh, we're going to get into the neurobiology a lot deeper. But for now, uh, I want you to think about the fact that the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus in the brains of um, severely depressed, major depressive disorder, these brain regions that are involved in, again, uh, executive functioning and memory, two very uh, kind of plastic processes in the brain have lower volumes, decreased connectivity, and abnormal activity. So they're smaller, they're not as interconnected, and they show abnormal activity. So get into that more, but I just want that to be kind of in your head as it go through this. I don't want it to be in your head because, you know, it's a symptom of depression, but you know what I mean. Okay, so um, to understand this, we need to get more into the neurobiology. Um, and because I want this to be as listenable as possible, I want this episode to be able to be listened to without um, too much effort. Um, don't feel like you need to memorize all the brain regions. I won't really be showing any visuals. Uh, I'll try to explain why these are significant throughout. So um, just try to maybe sit back and, and listen if you can. Okay. The neurobiology of depression, um, we're going to start with kind of that cognitive control, right? The, the, the PFC, the prefrontal cortex, this brain region right at the front of your brain. Um, this is extremely important in cognitive control and that executive functioning I was mentioning, the behavioral regulation, emotional regulation, motivation, uh, planning, working memory. The one big point is that in people with depression, the prefrontal cortex, specifically ventromedial and, and lateral regions, um, not really important where those are, but 
they're less able to exert top-down control over brain regions that are involved in emotional processing and, uh, and also um, kind of autonomic uh, bodily processing. This could lead to the overactivity of those brain regions or abnormal activity of those brain regions, um, like ones that trigger the stress response, specifically the amygdala. I have a whole video on the amygdala, but the amygdala is really um, strongly involved in this process of um, triggering the stress response. It's kind of its, its raison d'etre. Um, the it could also lead to underactivity of regions involved in pleasure and reward, like the striatum, nucleus accumbens, and other regions involved in dopamine signaling. And again, I'm gonna go deeper into all of this, but I want you to think about how the prefrontal cortex is less able to exert this top-down control on these emotionally relevant brain regions and how that could lead to some abnormal activity and network activity in that uh, prefrontal limbic uh, circuit. So. In other words, if you're depressed, your brain may be more likely to focus on unhappy information, to interpret ambiguous information in a negative way, to set off a stress response in reaction to that information, and to generally feel less pleasure. Um, so depression, but just remember, depression is complex, and it does not, it's not going to present exactly the same in everyone's brain. Again, going back to those different, different symptoms that people may uh, present with. But let's... Uh, Let's move on from there. So sticking with the prefrontal cortex, another thing that the prefrontal cortex does, specifically dorsal medial regions of the PFC, uh, it's involved in self-related processing, thinking about ourselves in kind of a social context, in the context of the world that we occupy, recognizing ourselves in a mirror, telling the story of our life, describing our mental characteristics to others. These are all processes that rely in some way, not entirely, but in many ways on the, pre the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. This is an area near the, the midline of the uh, uh, kind of top side of the, the PFC. The, the, the stre there's stress-induced neural atrophy and altered activity of the MPFC in, um, in depression often. And maybe, maybe this can help to explain some of the negative self, the self-loathing and negative thoughts about the self that many people who are depressed display. Um, that's a bit of speculation, but the big point is that the prefrontal cortex does not seem to be functioning as it would in a healthy brain. And it is involved in these processes of cognitive control, of emotional regulation, and of self-processing um, identity kind of. Now, another thing that uh, is a type of executive functioning, a type of cognitive control, is working memory. And this also relies on the prefrontal cortex as well as related regions, um, uh, networks involving the parietal lobe and the basal ganglia. But, but again, focusing in on, on the prefrontal cortex and its, um, its functions. So uh, short-term or this working memory is this this kind of like what's in the forefront of your mind? What information are you holding at the forefront of your mind? This is the type of memory that you use to remember a phone number. If somebody gives you their phone number and you, for some reason, don't have your phone on you and you have to run through those numbers in your head to, to remember it before you get somewhere where you can write that down. Um, there's kind of like a limited number of slots in working memory, but working memory, uh, there are deficits in working memory in depressed individuals, uh, often at least, and this involves, so working memory is not um, like long-term plasticity, it's not long-term memory by definition, but it does involve this kind of short-term plasticity, this flexibility of the brain to be able to hold different pieces of information and eventually maybe convert those into long-term memory. Um, so yeah, that is also closely related to uh, attention. Attention is kind of this mental spotlight. This we we uh, you know whenever we focus on something, you're using attention. So if you're watching this video, there's 
myriad things going on around you visually, auditorily, um, you know, every your feet on the ground, your butt in the chair, uh, but you're not thinking about those things. Your attention is on this square, this like my face, or you know, maybe your phone goes off, your attention gets drawn over there. But attention is kind of this amplification of information processing. And um, I mention this because there is an attentional bias in the depressed brain uh, to be hypersensitive to negative information. So uh, one example is that a depressed person might um, be hypersensitive to negative facial expressions on people in, in the surrounding area. And he might falsely detect like a negative emotional state from the slightest hint of a frown. And so this this may have to do not only with these uh, problems with prefrontal circuitry, but with a region called the amygdala. And again, I, I mentioned this earlier, the amygdala sets off the stress response, but the amygdala is also just involved in detecting important things in the environment. And the amygdala um, uh, kind of directs our attention toward important things in the environment. It already kind of has a bias toward negative stimuli. I talk about that in my my um, amygdala video where uh, negative facial expressions will cause a, a higher uh, response from the amygdala as compared to positive facial expressions. Um, so it's already kind of biased in that direction, but there may be an even more, uh, an even stronger bias in the kind of negative uh, attention of the, uh, the, the amygdala being hyper reactive to negative stimuli. So why is that? Why, why would it be hyperreactive to negative stimuli? And this comes back to chronic stress, the, the stress hormones that are kind of bathing the brain when you're in this chronically stressed state day after day after day. Chronic stress, like all stress, activates the fight or flight response to some extent. That stress response that kind of jacks up your heart rate, your blood pressure, um, slows down digestion, um, makes you alert and aware and, you know, start sweating and, um, stress will activate that response to, to some extent. And the amygdala is what triggers that response. And so stress, uh, if it is chronically activating that response, there's this interesting thing about the amygdala that it has its own kind of memory. It has its own plasticity where it learns to associate certain stimuli in the outside world with its triggering of the fight or flight response. And this is kind of the origin of fear memories, of fear conditioning. And I have a whole video on fear conditioning um, if you're interested in how that actually works at the level of the amygdala. Um, but this could lead the amygdala to associate less and less threatening stimuli with the stress response. So if you're chronically overactivating it, um, th this could be part of that, why there's this negative attention bias seen in depressed individuals um, may be a result of that, that mechanism. So that kind of attentional bias gets locked in. And maybe that's because the prefrontal cortex isn't able to modulate the activity of the amygdala, say, hey, that's not worthy of the stress response. That's just, you know, that's just an, a normal thing that you don't have to get so worked up about. We don't have to get all stressed out. But again, there's this lack of top-down control from the PFC to these limbic regions. And the PFC has a direct connection to the uh, amygdala. So that, uh, that could be part of that. Moving away from the fight or flight response, the stress response, um, I want to talk about motivation because motivation, lack of motivation is often a, a symptom of depression, right? You don't want to do those things that you used to do that are good for you or that you just like to do, right? So there's this motivation deficit, something going on there. And if any kind of neuroscientific discussion of motivation has to uh, come back to dopamine. So dopamine levels, uh, are strongly correlated kind of with our level of motivation. Um, when dopamine spikes, and I have a whole bunch of videos on dopamine, so you can go into this in a lot more detail. Um, Taylor Guthrie and I did a whole video on motivation. We talked a lot about dopamine, so check out that episode of The Social Brain um, on my channel. And um, anyway, I just wanna give an overview, kind of dopamine in a nutshell. So when, when dopamine levels rise, 
This one's neurotransmitter levels of this neurotransmitter uh, spike above their usual baseline. We get this sense of like anticipation. Of, it feels good and then we're motivated to take action. And when certain areas of the brain release dopamine, that signals that serves as a signal that we should take whatever action led to that dopamine release again in the future. So this is a plasticity mechanism. This is a learning mechanism. Dopamine is about helping us learn about what to do in our environment, what's good and what's not worth doing, what's not going to help us out, what is going to help us out and helps us to engage in those behaviors. Dopamine itself is not the reward. It's a signal uh, that the task we just engaged in or are about to engage in is rewarding. Um, and it is this, when, when you have a anticipation for something good to happen, there's, there's probably a lot of dopamine signaling going on there. And when dopamine levels go down, when they have like an inverse peak, like a valley, if you will, uh, dopamine, when it goes down past our usual baseline, that's a signal that we should avoid doing whatever caused the drop in the future. So if something unexpectedly good happens, we're going to get a spike of dopamine. That's going to train us to repeat whatever behavior led to that dopamine release. If dopamine goes down because something unexpectedly bad happened, that is going to train, uh, be, act as a signal uh, for us to learn to not do that kind of behavior in the future. Now, there is this finding, a little bit controversial, um, but it's the idea that depressed brains may release a smaller quantity of dopamine when something good happens. There's some doubt on that. So uh, see, there's a reference, I can't remember which one it is, but in the description, I think it's number nine, uh, the, the bottom, uh, the final reference in the, the list of references I have in the description of this video uh, that questions this idea. But it may be that depressed brains release a smaller quantity of dopamine when something good happens. So maybe, so possibly, the depressed brain is less efficient at tagging actions as valuable and therefore less efficient at learning to take those valuable actions in the future. So that could help explain, you know, why aren't you doing the things that are good for you? Well, it's just, it's not going to help. Nothing's going to work. It's not, you know, that, that would be like a typical response from someone who's, who's depressed. It, it's not worth it. It's not going to help me. It doesn't work for me. Um, that may be a result of this, this depressed, uh, the symptom of, of um, dopamine not being released in as high of a quantity uh, in response to something good. So again, we're seeing this rigidity, this, this lack of, of learning in the brain of, the, of a depressed brain. But on the other hand, there are, uh, the, the depressed brain may be just as good at healthy brains at dropping the dopamine levels below baseline when something bad happens. So, you know, just as good at kind of avoiding what is bad, um, but not as good at pursuing what is good. So in other words, depressed patients may be just as good at avoiding actions that lead to negative consequences, but maybe poorer at remembering and therefore engaging in actions that lead to positive outcomes. Okay, another part of motivation um, may have to do with a region of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. And this is a part of the cortex that's kind of uh, buried under the, uh, the frontal lobe. Um, it's, it's, you can't see it from the outside of the brain. Um, I've talked about this before in my episode on uh, interoception, so check that out if you're interested. Excuse me. Um, but the ACC may act as a cost-benefit analysis module in the brain. And you think, excuse me, what, does that have to do with uh, motivation? And basically, it can help to predict whether the results of a given action are worth the effort of taking that action, cost benefit. And you can imagine if that if the uh, you know benefits outweigh the cost, maybe we get this sense of motivation to do that thing. Um, I'll mention that this isn't necessarily uh, like a rock solid. Um, finding. It's not something that all neuroscientists agree on, but there are those who, who think that this may be what the ACC is, is kind of doing. And why am I mentioning this? Because the ACC has uh, in some studies been found to have decreased thickness in the depressed brain. So maybe these problems with motivation are stemming partly from the ACC. 
Okay. So moving on, um, probably the, the quintessential type of, or kind of category of plasticity in the brain is memory. You know, whenever you, you explain neuroplasticity, plasticity to someone, you would say, memory. Whenever you form a memory, that is the result of neurons changing their connections with each other, creating new connections. Um, so to form new memories, we have to have this, this plasticity intact. Now, depressed patients often show memory deficits um, in long-term memory of specific places, events, and experiences. Um, this is called declarative or explicit memory, right? Not so much implicit memory, which is like motor skill learning and unconscious conditioning um, that doesn't really show up there, but in this explicit memory. And um, explicit memory depends on the hippocampus. And this is coming back to, okay, severe depression can cause the hippocampus to shrink, right? And it can cause it to have kind of abnormal activity, messed up connectivity. And the hippocampus turns short-term memories into long-term memories, and it stores some of these memories for a temporarily for a short amount of time. But then uh, during sleep, primarily during sleep, the hippocampus communicates with the cerebral cortex to kind of store those memories in a uh, distributed fashion throughout the cortex. But you can imagine if the hippocampus is uh, has this kind of problematic activity, this, you know, lack of connection, lack of plasticity, these um, inability to form new synapses, then th there's going to be some deficits there. And uh, that is indeed, you know, the case in the depressed brain. And uh, one category, I'll talk about a couple, but one category is a prospective memory. So there studies have shown that um, depressed patients often perform worse than healthy participants on tasks where you have to remember to do something in the future, known as prospective memory. So the depressed brain tends to be worse at remembering to do something in the future. And again, we see that it's more rigid and less flexible than the healthy brain. Compared to healthy participants, um, Depressed patients are more likely to also remember negative information. This kind of goes back to this negative attention bias. What you're paying attention to, you're probably going to remember more of. But um, and but kind of more um, specific to this hippocampal uh, memory is they may have trouble remembering the details of their experience, especially positive experiences. So um, this. Uh, relates to this phenomenon uh, where depressed patients sometimes exhib exhibit overgeneral memory. And overgeneral memory is seen when someone has trouble remembering specific episodes or experiences, but they can still recall the general trajectory and story of those experiences. Um, like, for example, you, if you ask someone who's depressed uh, to remember, like, tell you about their recent vacation, right? I might just tell you, oh, we went. We had a uh, we went on a beach trip, went to the beach. But a non-depressed person would be more likely to to describe kind of specifics of that trip, more detail. Say, oh yeah, we went. My family and I we went to Playa del Carmen, Mexico. We learned to surf. We walked on the strip. Uh, we you know went and saw a bonfire. Or something like they'd have more details to the experience. And that is this uh, phenomenon of depressed patients maybe showing over general memory at a, a higher rate than healthy patients. Participants. <laughs> okay. Now, um, this brings me to somewhere I want to kind of wrap all this up because this has been a lot of information and I think we can kind of put all this together. So, the common thread running through all of this is that the depressed brain tends to be more rigid, inflexible, and less plastic than the brains of healthy individuals. So in general, if you put all these plasticity deficits together, it seems inescapable that the depressed brain will find it more difficult to learn and remember new things. And because of problems in those, um, those uh, cognitive control prefrontal circuits that regulate motivation and movement and emotion, it will also be harder to initiate new actions and generally to motivate oneself to do things. And I'll just mention here that 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 um, 
that association with, with motivation um, may have something to do with uh, that psychomotor disturbance, that like slowed movement. Um, there's uh, this, this uh, study from 2015, a review of neuroimaging findings by uh, Benny Lieberg and Christopher Rahm, and they concluded that psychomotor disturbance, um, they say, quote, in major depressive disorder emerges from altered limbic signals at the interface of emotion, volition, higher order cognitive function, and movement. So this is kind of bringing this together. There's this lack of flexibility, this lack of ability to initiate new behaviors or e even any behavior, whatever. But let's bring this back to like the individual to ourselves, because depression is not only, you know, about our, our thoughts and feelings, but it's also about the story of our, our lives as we relate it to ourselves. So all of the symptoms and mechanisms I've mentioned here may contribute in unique ways to this kind of storytelling. So the negative attention bias amplifies the negative voice in our head telling us we're useless. And it amplifies, you know, this bad news we see, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. Like we are, we become focused on the negatives, the, the bad things that are happening around us and unable to pay attention to the positives or, or just biased in the direction of, of the negative. But the medial prefrontal cortex, this, this region involved in forging our self-identity and kind of writing our, our, the story of ourselves, if, if we're always focusing on what's wrong with ourselves, Maybe this is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that sort of makes us start to act as that useless, you know, unworthy person would. We tell ourselves we're useless. We tell ourselves we're unworthy. And what do we do? We do what that kind of person would do. Nothing of value. And, and we keep reinforcing this self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, I want to talk here. I'm I'm beginning to, to speculate and to kind of extend these findings and try to integrate them uh, into you know, my experience and, and what I understand is like a common experience of depression. Um, so I just want to kind of throw that in there. But um, the, the uh, atrophied or the otherwise problematic wiring that links the PFC to the ACC, the, that region involved in, uh, in motivation, as well as the basal ganglia also involved in, in motivation and, and learning and motor movements, um, and this possibility of a reduced dopamine response, this may, you know, strip us down to a kind of a bare minimum of motivation. Then the hyperreactive amygdala and the stress response can make the smallest tasks seem overwhelming, make everything just seem so hard and scary and difficult and, um, you know, just putting all this together, it's it just... Sounds absolutely awful, and it is. Um, the atrophied hippocampus, as we were talking about, the the memory, um, the, the problems with memory, it may make it harder to remember the good times or to, to picture a brighter future. And then something I didn't really talk about, but I think kind of brings this together, is that um, inflammation, both in the brain and body, uh, hyperactive immune response, is associated with depression probably having to do with this chronic stress response, which leads us to feeling like physically ill as if we have like the cold or flu, or at least some symptoms of that, you know, we withdraw socially. And, um, and so you can kind of see how all these biological mechanisms, all this, this neurological architecture and how it's changed in the depressed brain sort of helps to explain what's happening in the mind and what it's like to be depressed. And then all of this makes it difficult to do the things that would actually make us feel better, like seeking social support, seeking out our friends and family, exercising regularly, eating healthily, sleeping well, reaching out to mental health professionals. And instead we withdraw from social life. We just, you know, we lay uh, curled up under the covers as the world passes us by, locked into this world, locked into this, this bad mood, this anhedonia, this unmotivated state. And we conclude that nothing, not even a trained therapist, not even, you know, research-backed, evidence-based treatments for depression could help us. We falsely believe that kind of thing. It could not make our lives better. This is just how we are. This is who we are, you know? But life gradually in that state can become unbearable. And the mind becomes so rigid and unwilling to entertain thoughts of self-improvement or the possibility of healing. 
Um, and I just want to quote this uh, psychologist, and he's also a meditation teacher named Locke Kelly. He said that someone who is depressed is time bound in the present. They're unable to remember the happier times and unable to imagine future well being. So the depressed brain is the site of the perfect storm of inflexibility because so many of the mechanisms that underlie depression are related to neuroplasticity, it may hamper neuroplasticity. And so maybe this can, can explain why it's so hard to become happy in that state. But there is hope. There are treatments, there are research-based uh, methods for getting out of that rigid state, getting out of depression. And I want to emphasize this here and talk about how some of the most common treatments for depression may be tapping in to these plasticity mechanisms. And in fact, they have to, to some extent, for us to change, for us to become better, to become happier, less depressed, you know, this is going to involve a change in how our brains are working at the, ultimately at the cellular level, but at this level of networks. How does that happen? What are, what are these different treatments doing? And so I'll first just mention kind of the classical uh, antidepressants, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs, which you may have heard of, or similar, um, the SNRIs, the selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. These are the most common form of, um, or the most common type of antidepressant. And uh, the, the, the old idea was, okay, there's a chemical imbalance and we are increasing the, the, using SSRIs to increase the concentration of serotonin in the brain. And so there's this deficit of serotonin and then we add in more serotonin and boom, that fixes the issue. But there's been some studies recently, especially last year, 2022 study that showed that that correlation, uh, just, it's just not there. That lowered serotonin uh, is not, can't, may not be the cause of depression, at least not in most cases. And SSRIs have kind of been the subject of a lot of, um, a lot of debate because it's like, are they really working? Are they, are they better than placebo? And I think this, this goes back to our, our uh, individual variability. You know, often when somebody goes to a psychiatrist to get an SSRI or to get an antidepressant, the first one may not work. The second one may not work, but maybe the third one does. Maybe that helps. And so we're, we're seeing this individual variability in the precise uh, changes that are happening in an individual's brain that are, that are contributing to or possibly causing the depression. But there is also evidence that serotonin Increasing concentration of serotonin in the brain can lead to an enhancement of cellular plasticity mechanisms over a, a longer time period than some of the other stuff I'm going to talk about here, which may explain why uh, usually when people get on the SSRIs, it takes at least or around two weeks um, for the, the effects to really take hold. Now, exercise. Exercise has been known for a while to be kind of probably the most potent behavioral intervention that can increase, enhance neuroplasticity, even in the healthy brain. And it also has this effect. Um, this is, there's a little bit of, uh, of debate about this, whether this is necessarily the case, but that, that exercise may enhance uh, this thing called neurogenesis, this process of birthing new neurons. And primarily where that happens if indeed it does happen in the adult brain, is the hippocampus. New neurons can be born in the, I believe the enterino, or sorry, the dentate gyrus, part of the hippocampus, <coughs> excuse me. But that's really interesting, right? We're talking about how the, the stress, chronic stress and depression can lead to this shrunken, um, less uh, lower connectivity, abnormal activity in the hippocampus, right? So if, if there's an intervention, that pushes back against that, enhances neuroplasticity, maybe even enhances neurogenesis, creating new neurons there. Maybe this will ex helps to explain why exercise has such a potent effect on depression symptoms in many people. I'll say with both SSRIs and exercise, there is a, um, in, in each case, a distinct uh, kind of neurochemical effect. So SSRIs are indeed increasing serotonin in the brain, and serotonin does just kind of make you feel better, make you feel like everything's okay, that things are good. Um, 
And so that that may be part of the uh, the helpful aspect of SSRIs. And similarly with exercise, it is um, releasing like epinephrine, so adrenaline and noradrenaline and um, possibly dopamine too when you enjoy the exercise. So there are these just like uh, enhancement of, of, of signaling of various neurotransmitters and we shouldn't um, just brush that aside as unimportant. That probably does help people to feel better and may actually um, be part of this process of like enhancing neuroplasticity. Next up, kind of therapy, talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy specifically. I think that it's not controversial to say that if you are experiencing depression, if what I've been saying here resonates with you, seeking out a therapist, specifically cognitive behavioral therapist, um, is a great idea. This is a has a lot of strong evidence for being a really good way of uh, overcoming depression or at least lessening the symptoms to a very significant extent, especially when combined with um, you know things like exercise and uh, these other interventions that we're talking about. But it basically, you know, it's providing cognitive tools. It's providing cognitive behavioral tools for depressed individuals to push back against the rigidity of their brains and their minds and their behaviors through this consistent, repeated reframing and, and other cognitive tools. So I just want to read a quote from the study that we've been talking about so much, the uh, Rebecca Price and Ronald Duman's 2020 study, um, or their, their paper that we're talking about here, the integrative model. They write, quote, Efficacious cognitive behavioral treatments therefore focus on the goal of expanding plasticity within perceptions and conscious representations of the patient's internal and external worlds through repeated deliberate practice in recognizing and correcting maladaptive, excessively negative thought patterns. So it's kind of that in a nutshell. I, I really like that quote. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Last up, I want to talk about some of the cutting edge um, antidepressants or, or therapies, um, pharmacological therapies for depression. And you may have heard of some of these. I've talked about them on my channel a little bit. Psychedelics, classical psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD. Um, these are drugs that, you know, you've probably heard of them in the context of like you know, the 1960s are kind of like hippie, but also it just, they're really common now for people to take and, and, uh, have, you know, like a, a trip, go on a, take a trip on these drugs. Um, but there's these really interesting, uh, clinical trials that have shown that these drugs are effective, amazingly effective, uh, at alleviating depression when they're in the context of these guided sessions with a, a professional therapist, someone who are a, um, I think they're called psychedelic uh, therapist or psychedelic psychiatrist um, to alleviate depression after one session. How is that possible? How is it that a single session using these drugs can help someone massively alleviate depression, not only depression, but anxiety disorders, chronic pain disorders as well. There's some really amazing, inspiring stories about this. Um, if you want to learn more about that, check out the, uh, the um, documentary on Netflix called How to Change Your Mind. It's based on a book by the science writer Michael Pollan uh, by the same name, How to Change Your Mind. Really good, goes into the history and the science of how these drugs work. But basically, they, um, they bind to a specific type of serotonin receptor called the 5-HT2A receptor. You don't have to remember that. But um, the 2A receptor may, um, according to uh, the neuroscientists uh, Robin Carhart-Harris and David Nutt, I've done a whole video on this on my channel, but this idea that this receptor may open up a kind of window of plasticity in the cortex during this the, the trip, basically, when, when you're like tripping on these drugs, can open up this window of plasticity and allow people to reorganize their mind, to check, uh, to become, uh, like do a lot of therapy in a single session, basically just like a, a effective cramming session for therapy. Similarly, um, ketamine, I mentioned ketamine at the beginning, and both uh, uh, Rebecca Price and Ronald Duman did s seminal, really amazing work with ketamine. Um, and I recommend those, uh, those talks I talked about. They're in the, uh, 
the description of this video under related content. I have two of their talks listed. And uh, the idea is that ketamine uh, does something really similar to what, what they think psilocybin and LSD are doing in terms of opening up this window of neuroplasticity. And ketamine interacts with NMDA receptors, which are the kind of um, quintessential uh, uh, receptors for plasticity in the brain. Uh, they are um, a type of glutamate receptor. It's not super important, but the idea is that they may uh, be interacting with these receptors in such a way that creates this massively plastic state. And uh, again, this is most effective in the context of a guided session with a professional therapist, someone who is really experienced with doing this kind of thing and bringing someone through uh, this kind of experience. Um, but it is this idea that you can open this window of plasticity and then the therapist and the patient can leverage that to sort of um, change their whole conception of, of who they are in, in a much faster way than is possible uh, without these drugs typically. Again, I'm not telling you to do any of this stuff. Please don't just go out and take ketamine or psilocybin or LSD. Um, don't do that uh, without going through the proper channels and uh, talking to a doctor about really any of this stuff except probably exercise. Exercise is just pretty much good for anybody who does it. Um, okay, so that, that kind of wraps up this whole discussion. And uh, I really appreciate your support and uh, watching this episode. And uh, again, this is a Patreon only live stream. So if you want to get access to these kinds of live streams in the future, if you're watching this later, um, as it's, uh, it will come out on, on the public feed after the live stream. But if you want to get access to the live streams, ask questions, make comments in real time, um, sign up for Sense of Mind's Patreon at patreon.com slash sense of mind. Um, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, and uh, I'll catch you next time.